Welcome colleagues. It's a pleasure to invite you to join us at this uh, webinar jointly undertaken by uh, IOF, SKO and the Economist Intelligence Unit. And the topic we're going to discuss today uh, is uh, integrated care pathways uh, as optimal approaches for bone health. And I'm joined by uh, a stellar cast. Um, if I just introduce them briefly, so Mary Bussell graduated from um, Georgetown University in Washington. Uh, she works at the Economist's uh, Intelligence Unit and really has the um, lead role for global research on bone health. Eugene McCluskey, as you know, is Professor of uh, Metabolic Bone Disease at the University of Sheffield and one of the academic leads at the Mellonby Institute there and has had a long history of working on risk assessment and intervention in osteoporosis. Uh, Jean-Yves Reginster is Professor of Public Health at the University of Liège. He, of course, also hardly needs um, introduction. He's President of ESCAO and the Chair of the Committee of National Societies at the IOF. And, uh, of course, myself, uh, Chair of Rheumatology and Director of the MRC's Epidemiology Unit at the Universities of Southampton and Oxford in the UK and President of IOF. So it just remains for me to introduce our first speaker, Mary Bussell, who's going to tell us about this integrated care pathway subject as a whole. Mary. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. It is a pleasure and I am delighted to speak with you today about the Economist Intelligence Unit report, which provides a global overview of policies to protect and promote bone health. The Economist Intelligence Unit is part of the Economist Group and a sister company of the Economist newspaper. We provide consulting services to industry and governments and have been sponsored by Amgen to conduct a global policy overview on the integrated care pathways for bone health. As people age, two factors become increasingly important, memory and mobility. The burden of poor bone health is increasing around the world as populations age. Addressing poor bone health is the most important way to preserve mobility in aging populations. Over 200 million people worldwide are impacted by osteoporosis. This affects one in three women and poor bone health in them causes a greater amount of hospitalization burden, a greater hospitalization burden than for diabetes, heart attacks, and breast cancer. While in one in five men, poor bone health results in one third of fractures worldwide and is the highest risk of mortality post-fracture. Fractures cause reduced quality of life due to a loss of mobility, social isolation, depression, and pain. Those with osteoporosis faced higher healthcare costs when managing osteoporosis along with another chronic illness. Costs can be 13 to 23% higher due to poor bone health. 56% of people suffering a hip fracture become dependent on informal care, resulting in a financial burden for families and employers. 7.6 million sick days were due to fractures in France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Sweden, and the UK in 2017. In 2018, fractures cost the United States $52 billion, which is projected to climb 83% to $95 billion by 2040. Having identified the parameters and refine the framework for our research. We gathered experts to a virtual panel that met monthly for five months. These experts, three of whom are with us today, were instrumental in guiding our understanding of the issues and the opportunities for improvement. The final report and the policy briefing paper describe opportunities for further improvement. Prevention is the most important action to decrease the future burden of poor bone health. 
primary prevention measures begin by identifying people at a higher risk of, for fracture. Primary care must be embedded into integrated care pathways for bone health for people of all ages. Building healthy bones in early years before problems can emerge is vital. And we need to equip primary care providers with the educational resources to utilize the tools to improve the care they deliver. Integration of primary care can ensure fully integrated care pathways to improve comprehensive care for bone health throughout life. Once a fracture has occurred, an individual is twice the risk of experiencing another, yet only 20% of people with a fracture receive treatment in the year post-fracture. Secondary care delivery can be challenging as there is no clinical specialty dedicated to solely to bone health. Building multidisciplinary teams is crucial. Gaps from a population perspective, there is a lack of understanding and many misconceptions. Poor bone health is not an inevitable part of aging. Among health professionals, bone health does not garner the same level of attention as other long-term conditions, leading to a lack of preparedness. With payers, a gap exists between the people receiving treatment and the care they need versus those who really could use it. Among policymakers, there is a lack of clear communication. Over 200 guidelines exist for osteoporosis worldwide, yet few address the challenges and needs within primary care that can be flexibly adapted to local contexts. No single strategy will be sufficient to address this global issue. Coordination across all stakeholder groups is vital to decrease the health and socioeconomic burden of poor bone health. Integrated primary care will ensure fully integrated care pathways, which will improve the comprehensive care for bone health throughout a person's life. Non-trauma related fractures should be investigated to determine whether they are osteoporotic in origin and development of long-term management plans can promote better outcomes. Engaging key stakeholders will lead to success. From a population perspective, the key is myth-busting through education and awareness campaigns. For health professionals, building multidisciplinary teams to ensure the right approach, health promotion, disease awareness, prevention and treatment are delivered at the right time. Among payers, we need, to, we need to incentivize and reimburse care for bone health. And among policymakers, ensuring that there is better understanding of the socioeconomic and health consequences of poor bone health to promote better policies to address the needs. Building a more resilient health system to improve bone health is based upon the evidence and sound policy making and it will only improve population health as well as provide cost savings to the health systems by promoting bone health in the first place working across the lifespan we can all benefit from improved bone health throughout the ages and stages of our lives the qr code here will take you directly to our report. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Sherry. We move on now with you, Julie. Thank you very much, uh, Cyrus, and uh, thanks to Mary for setting the scene. And it's uh, my pleasure to uh, expand a little on the role of uh, primary care uh, in, uh, sorry, let me just see if I lost my screen. 
There's a screen back again, I hope. Uh, so I want to expand on the role of uh, primary care and primary uh, fracture prevention. Um, and uh, Mary has set the scene, uh, the burden of disease is well known, uh, and the particular emphasis on the treatment gap, the lack of recognition of risk of fracture, uh, and the opportunity to intervene with well-proven treatments uh, is really something that we need to improve through developing uh, integrated care pathways across primary and secondary care, as well as other sectors of, uh, of society. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. So in the vast majority of countries, we have clinical guidelines on osteoporosis. Uh, we have clinical guidelines uh, within those on fracture risk assessment. And this is just an example from the UK from uh, the NICE guidance from 2012. And basically that recommends that uh, as physicians, as uh, nurses working in primary care and other settings, we should be considering uh, the assessment of fracture risk in all women aged 65 years and over and all men uh, aged 75 years and over. So there's really is this emphasis in the older population of considering uh, the assessment of fracture risk. And it's a sad fact that while the guidelines exist, uh, the implementation of those guidelines is really uh, suboptimal. Uh, we've recently demonstrated this in the setting of primary care in eight uh, European countries uh, where we recruited GPs to simply uh, observe women aged 70 and over coming through their primary care uh, doors uh, for a variety of reasons unrelated to osteoporosis, uh, but then captured their risk factors for osteoporosis to see uh, what the treatment gap uh, might be in the primary care setting. So in this study that we published uh, earlier this year, we have just under 4,000 uh, women that have attended their GP across these eight countries. Uh, and in these women, all of whom were over the age of 70, we identified over half, 55%, were actually at increased risk of uh, fragility fracture. Uh, I don't have time this morning to go into the definitions that were used, but half of them were at increased risk. And two thirds of those were driven by the fact that they'd had a prior fracture uh, in their postmenopausal uh, years. So prior fracture is a, a big driver in secondary care and in primary care, but there are other risk factors that we know that we can integrate through fracture risk assessment tools such as FRACS uh, to identify patients at increased risk uh, of fracture. But the treatment gap was still huge. And you can see here that in uh, those who are identified at increased risk of, of fracture, uh, the uh, three quarters of them, 75%, were not receiving treatment for osteoporosis. That was improved somewhat if the patients and only a small number of the patients had actually undergone a bone mineral density and a smaller proportion of those had a T-score of less than minus 2.5, you can see that that recognition, the connection between a diagnosis and treatment, meant that the treatment gap was much smaller here. 21% uh, of those who had a T-score of less than minus 2.5 were not receiving uh, osteoporosis treatment. Likewise, if the patient had a diagnosis of osteoporosis uh, in their medical record, then uh, two-thirds were receiving treatment. It's a sad fact that one-third still weren't receiving treatment. But if that diagnosis wasn't recorded in the patient record, then virtually all of these patients uh, were not receiving treatment. And as I mentioned, two thirds of those at risk were driven by having a prior fracture. But you can see on the bottom right of the slide that even the prior fracture, any prior fracture, 71% in this study were not receiving treatment. And that ranged from 76% of a variety of non-vertebral, non-hip fractures down to the best performance which was in those with prior spine fractures. And you can see that the treatment gap there was somewhat smaller, but still high uh, at 42%. So there's really uh, an, a treatment gap that is really driven by an awareness gap. So how do we try to close that gap in the, the primary care setting? And there's been much thought given over the last few years to the potential now for population screening, or at least enhance case finding in primary care uh, to try to get to grips with the, the treatment gap. 
Uh, many of you will be familiar with the 10 criteria that were put forward uh, over 50 years ago by uh, Jungner and Wilson, uh, looking at uh, what criteria need to be fulfilled for the, a successful enhanced case finding or screening program to be implemented. Uh, and I think there's absolutely no doubt that you would agree, uh, because you've tuned in this morning to listen to this uh, webinar, that the condition should be an important health problem, uh, that there should be facilities for diagnosis and treatment. We all work in such facilities. Uh, and really, in the next few slides, I just want to focus in on the ones that I put the, the star beside here. You can see that one of the uh, 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 scores here is given in amber rather than green. Uh, and this is really the final one, that case finding should be a continuing process and not a once and for all project. Uh, and I think that's really important about the implementation. We need to look for strategies that allow our primary care colleagues to manage a chronic disease over a long term uh, in identifying patients and ensuring that they can adhere to, uh, to treatments in the long term uh, to uh, reduce the fracture risk. So the first thing is, uh, how can we uh, identify those uh, at risk? Uh, and uh, some of you will have seen uh, the SCOOP study that we published in The Lancet uh, a few years ago now. Uh, and this was really a study within primary care uh, in the UK, uh, seven geographical regions where uh, through the GPs, we wrote to women aged 70 to 85 years of age, uh, some of whom then randomized to just normal standard care through their GP and the other half were randomized to be screened using the FRAX questionnaire, followed by an additional bone mineral density. And that bone mineral density result not looked at for the T-score of minus 2.5, but the value of the bone mineral density fed back into the FRAX calculation to determine whether the uh, woman was at high risk or low risk uh, and whether they needed treatment or not. And within that, we can look at the test and the intervention. And these are two key components uh, of an enhanced case finding or a screening strategy. Uh, and on the, the left here, here's the test. So this is uh, at baseline, we're looking at the FRAX hip fracture probability, estimated without BMD, because not all the women had bone mineral density measurements. Uh, and you can see that uh, this is by quintile, and you can see there's a lovely stepwise increase in the observed incidence of hip fractures during follow-up across these five quintiles. Uh, and you can see that there's about a six uh, to seven fold higher incidence in those in the highest quintile compared to those in the, the lowest quintile. So the test can successfully stratify risk uh, within uh, the population. On the right, we're looking at the impact of identifying women at high risk, conveying to them that they are at high risk, conveying to their GPs that they're at high risk and what action is then taken. So we obviously have evidence from many large, well-conducted uh, RCTs. Uh, we have licensed medications that we know reduce the risk of fractures. And you can see uh, that in this study, within six months, the light uh, but tall gray bars here are the women within the intervention group, the screening group that were identified to be at high risk. And you can see that 75% of those were exposed to osteoporosis medications within the first six months of taking part in the study. And that compares uh, in the uh, right-hand dark bar here to the control group. You can see that the overall exposure to osteoporosis medications is really very small uh, indeed. So the test worked. The test was then translated into increased exposure to osteoporosis treatments. And that then led to a reduction uh, in hip fractures. And on the left, we saw this 28% reduction uh, in hip fractures. The number needed to screen uh, to prevent one hip fracture in this setting uh, was 111. The number needed to treat to prevent one hip fracture was in the order of 28. Uh, and we estimate that if we implement at SCOOP exactly as it was conducted within the, the SCOOP trial, uh, with the uh, proportions of population reached, the proportions taking uh, up the study approach and so on, that we could prevent about 8,000 hip fractures annually uh, in the UK. Not only is it effective, but it's also highly cost effective. In fact, in analysis uh, published just last year, uh, it's actually a cost saving approach. The total cost of the screening compared to the usual management had a net saving of 286 uh, euros in that uh, particular uh, analysis. So there's uh, a 
a, a benefit, not just for the patients, but a benefit for the healthcare system uh, in reducing uh, fracture-related costs. That study, the SCOOP study, has been combined with two other studies that uh, were conducted, one in Denmark and uh, uh, one in uh, the Netherlands, uh, the uh, ROSE and uh, SOS studies. Uh, this was a paper published by the authors of the uh, Dutch study earlier uh, uh, last year. And again, you're looking at the bottom here at the hip fractures. And in this meta-analysis of all three trials, there's a highly significant 20% reduction uh, in the uh, number of hip fractures. In terms of major osteoporotic fractures, it was a 9% uh, reduction again, but a statistically significant effect. So these approaches can work and they can reduce the risk of and the incidence of uh, fractures and particularly hip fractures in this setting. So what do we need to do? Uh, well, we need to improve implementation. Um, and this pyramid is well known to many of you looking at the uh, approach to care from, if you like, the sharp end, uh, which is the sort of the late stage disease, those patients with hip fracture. We know that we've done much to improve the hospital care and aftercare of patients with hip fractures. Uh, in the next talk uh, from uh, Jean-Yves, we're going to hear about the potential for uh, nipping the fracture after the fracture uh, in the bud. Uh, and I've been talking about that next layer down, but really being aware of and identifying individuals at high risk of fracture uh, that we can then target for successful treatment. Our policymakers <laughs> need to be aware of the fact that these approaches can be cost saving. Uh, and uh, I, that should attract them uh, to looking at means by which we can uh, implement this uh, in a more widely applicable uh, way. The implementation for our colleagues in primary care will really need us to look at how we improve and almost certainly semi-automate at least the awareness and assessment of fracture risk. Uh, we're all using electronic patient records these days, so we need to be able to uh, uh, and enable them to have age and risk factor related alerts uh, with automated risk calculations. We need to improve the understanding uh, uh, about the treatments and the initiation and persistence with treatments. Uh, and ideally, of course, we need primary care and secondary care uh, to work together uh, with uh, other sectors within the community to do our best to reduce the burden of fractures in the future. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Eugene, for that um, terrific overview of the primary care story, uh, following Mary's outline of the integrated care pathways as a whole. So let's now move on to Professor Jean-Yves Regenster, who will address the secondary care component of this story. Jean-Yves, thank you. Thank you very much, Cyrus. Uh, here are my conflicts of interest. Uh, there are very few areas in medicine where integrated care pathways play a greater role than in secondary prevention of osteoporosis. As it was said earlier, osteoporosis places a major economical burden on the society. And you can see here that the cost of fragility fractures in the European Union is equivalent to the sum of the cost generated by the strokes and by the coronary heart diseases. Nevertheless, very few people who have experienced centre fracture receive an appropriate treatment. Would we accept that less than 20% of people who have experienced such a heart attack receive a secondary prevention? I guess we wouldn't, but that's what's happening in osteoporosis. A couple of years ago, we showed that even after a hip fracture, which is the most dramatic event that can occur in the life of an osteoporotic patient, less than 5% of such patients were receiving an appropriate treatment 12 months after the fracture. And unfortunately, the situation is not improving over time. As you can see here, if we look at the treatment gap, which is the percentage of patients who deserve an anti-osteoporosis treatment, uh, the percentage of patients who, who should be treated for osteoporosis, and the percentage of patients who actually receive the treatment, you see that comparing 2010 in blue bars, 
and 2017 in Orange Bar, the situation has not been improving in any of the major European countries. And looking at what's happening and in average in these countries, we see that 56% of such patients, those who should have been treated for osteoporosis, were not treated in 2010. That proportion has been rising up to 73% in 2017. That's already dramatic per se, but the real problem in osteoporosis is that we know that when a patient has been experiencing a fracture, that particular patient has a dramatic increase in his or in her risk to sustain a new fracture within a short period of time. And that risk is particularly important within the first year after the sentinel fracture. As you can see, more than 50% of the recurrent fracture after hip fracture, spine fracture, or humerus fracture, and to a lesser extent, forearm fracture, up to 50% of this fracture occur within 12 months after what we call the sentinel fracture. So what we need clearly is to provide a solution for those patients who have already experienced the fracture. But even in those for which a diagnosis of fracture has not been made, we have the opportunity to calculate their individual fracture risk and to tell them whether or not they are at high risk for osteoporotic fracture within the next, the, the next 10 years. And we can do that with algorithms, including the a uh, FRAX tool that has been developed by Eugene McCluskey and John Kennis when they were at the WHO Collaborating Center in Sheffield, we have the opportunity, even in those patients without a prevalent fracture, to see whether they are at high risk to present the fracture in the coming months or in the coming years. And that's the reason why when the IOF and SKO published their algorithm for the management of osteotic patients, they recommended as a first step to assess the risk of fracture in, the, in an individual patient and to distinguish between low risk, high risk, and very high risk patients. What do we need in such patients at high risk or very high risk? We need strength and we need speed. We need strength because we need to restore bone health and we need speed because we know that the maximal risk of presenting a new fracture will occur within a couple of months after the diagnosis or after the occurrence of the first fracture. There has been during the last year a change in the paradigm for the treatment of osteoporosis in such patients and now we all agree that in such patients the treatment should be initiated with a bone forming agent, an anabolic agent, rather than with an antiresorptive agent because of this need for strength and because of this need for speed. We know that the bone forming agent restores bone health much quicker than antiresorptive agent do. If we look at the left bottom part of that slide, which represents the total hip BMD changes during anti-osteoporosis treatment, we see in green what's happening when the patients receive romazosumab, which is the newest, the newest uh, and presumably the most active bone forming agent currently available, compared to what happens when they receive in blue the nosumab which is presumably the most active antiresorptive agent. After 12 months of romozozumab, the increase in bone mineral density at the total hip level is similar to what you see after three and a half years of administration of the best antiresorptive agent. And if you combine one year of romozozumab in green followed by one year of denazumab in blue, the outcome of this treatment, the benefit of this treatment, is similar to what you see after giving denazumab alone for seven years. So we have the strengths, we have the speed. And that, translate, and that translates into a greater impact on fracture reduction. If we compare ramazosimab to the most widely prescribed bisphosphonate worldwide, the lantronate, you'll see that there is a greater effect on, on vertebral fracture reduction, on clinical fracture reduction and on non-vertebral fracture reduction, and that this beneficial effect occur as soon 
as one year of treatment. What is interesting with the anabolic agents and more specifically with rumozuzumab is that the efficacy on fracture outcome is greater in patients at high baseline fracture risk. If you look at the right bottom part of the screen now, we see that for the reduction of non-vertebral fracture, the effect is greater in the patients who have the highest probability of a major osteoporotic fracture at baseline. And this justifies why in our algorithm for the bad engine of patients, we conclude that in patients at very high risk of fracture, anabolic agents should be initiated first and followed by an inhibitor of bone with option. Nevertheless, we know that there is this treatment gap and that patients should be identified, patients should be motivated to receive treatment, patients should be prescribed treatment, and patients should be encouraged to pursue the treatment and increase the adherence to treatment. And to do this, the best way is to implement the fracture liaison service. You have here the conceptual model of a fracture liaison service that start by identifying fragility fracture patients, investigating those patients, and providing a fracture risk assessment. Then, starting a personalized treatment and a recommendation for such treatment should be made through primary care physician. That treatment should be monitored for initiation and for adherence. And if <clears throat> such a fracture liaison service can be implemented, there will be fewer refractors, fewer secondary care admission, fewer care home admission, and eventually healthcare benefit for the patient and for the society. I like this slide from the Royal Osteoporosis Society in the United Kingdom that summarized the standards for an appropriate fracture liaison service. Identify, investigate, inform, intervene, and integrate. The International Osteoporosis Foundation considers that the implementation of fracture liaison service is one of its flagship operations through the Capture the Fracture Partnership Program. The Capture the Fracture Partnership Program has been, as I mentioned, initiated by OF in close collaboration with the University of Oxford, and our chairman has been the architect of this project, Professor Cooper, and we receive an unrestricted educational grant from two corporate partners, namely Amgen and UCP. The objective of this particular project is to combine top-down and bottom-up activities and seeks to reduce fracture by 25% in the coming years. And you see that the pillars are policy change, increasing the prioritization of, of osteoporotic fracture with government and payers, advocacy alliances between societies, governments, and NGOs at global, regional, and local level, mentorship program to provide best practices, support, and mentorship to establish new post-fracture care program, scalable solution for, improve it, for improving the understanding of the benefits of the post-fracture care programs, and eventually leverage a post-fracture care digital global data set to, upset, to obtain consistent understanding across capture the fracture site of post-fracture care effectiveness. And this, has been implemented now with those five key pillars, policy, coalition, mentorship, scalable solution, and digital tools across 17 countries, even 18 now, in Asia Pacific, Europe, Latin America, and the Middle East. We want to develop and implement new capture the fracture initiative. We want to double the existing fracture liaison program, services program, and eventually the objective is to reduce HIP and vertebral fractures by 20% by 2025. There are a lot of tools that have been developed by the International Osteoporosis Foundation to support this program, the mentorship program, best practice framework, slide kits, toolkit, webinars, global patient charter, and benefit calculator. All this was allowed to implement, help managing, and increase sustainability of the fracture liaison services around the world. And you see here that one of the last achievements 
is a patient level key performance indicator set to measure the effectiveness of fractal liaison services and guide quality improvement. It is a work that has been conducted under the IOF banner. So colleagues, I would say that integrated care pathway play a major role in secondary prevention of osteoporosis. We need to have all stakeholders working together. We need to have a framework for the, for the fracture liaison service implementation. The Capture the Fracture Partnership Program of IOF provides the framework for this, provides a tool for this. And once this is done, we can offer to our patients the appropriate chemical entities, the appropriate medication to quickly and strongly improve their bone health. I would like to remind you that the World Congress on Osteoporosis will take place this year virtually between August 26 and August 29, and that the deadline for submission of your science, of your abstract, is set up at May the 26th. So I would like to warmly thank you for your attention, and I give the floor back to our Chairman, Professor Cyrus Cooper. Thank you very much, Jean-Yves, for that um, elegant overview of um, the secondary uh, prevention story uh, to complement uh, where we are. Now, let me screen share. That should be perfect. And so it just remains for me to uh, bring together those themes and talk about how we might undertake a call to action on integrated care pathways for bone health. Um, I'll cover for you some of the newer data on burden of osteoporotic fracture and then bring together some of the themes that uh, Jean-Yves and uh, Eugene have um, discussed in secondary and primary prevention throughout the life course and then uh, close out by returning to Mary's oversight of the content of um, an integrated care pathway for the disorder that might be genericized and then made country specific. So as, as you heard earlier, much of the baseline data from uh, for fractures throughout Europe came from a study undertaken by John Canis, Eugene and uh, his team uh, in 2010, uh, a scope study. And this has been repeated for 2019 by John, uh, Fred Borgstrom, Eugene and, uh, and colleagues, and is in press at present for the uh, 25 plus, for the 27 plus two countries, Switzerland and the UK, that comprise the EU uh, broader framework. And they will yield very contemporaneous data on fracture burden. The annual number of fractures will rise uh, from 4.28 million in 2019 to over 5 million, a 24.8% uh, increase over the period uh, till the 2030s. That significant increase in the number of fragility fractures expected will be particularly pronounced in men, a 42.6% increase in the bottom left panel, uh, as compared with a just below 30% increase in women. The annual expenditure uh, approximates 55.3 billion euros, which equates to 3.5% of EU healthcare spending. The fracture burden by fracture site is uh, updated, and you can see this depicted here with hip fractures, forearm fractures, and vertebral fractures coming to clinical attention, let alone all of those that we might um, diagnose with the introduction of IVA on a large scale, accounting for approximately a sixth each. You can see 19% for hip fracture, 16% for vertebral fracture, and 15% for forearm fracture, with half uh, that are shown in caramel on the right-hand um, part of the pie chart, uh, accounting uh, by all other fracture sites. And as I said, 4.3 million new fragility fractures in 2019. And if we're thinking about the dentometric osteoporosis, 25.5 million women and 6.5 million men, uh, amounting to 32 million individuals, approximately four times as many women uh, with densitometric osteoporosis as men, and the um, frequencies in women aged over 50 shown in the bottom panel. 
So uh, clearly a major issue for policymakers, and as you saw, persisting therapeutic gaps, people at high risk of fracture, not risk assessed and treated um, on a wide scale, continuing throughout these European countries. So we now have widely utilized guidance for the diagnosis and management of osteoporosis. These are the most recent IOF and SCAO guidelines from 2019. They help us to update targeting of therapy with the broadening armamentarium. You've heard a little bit about the bisphosphonates and donozumab within the anti-resorptive class. Uh, we now have teriparatide, its biosimilars, as well as remesozumab and abalaparatide in the formation stimulating agents. We make the diagnosis uh, within these guidelines using the WHO methodology and a DXA-based BMD at spine or hip and T-score less than minus 2.5. Fracture risk assessment is undertaken using country-specific FRAX fracture probability and uh, vertebral fractures are assessed either by VFA or by uh, radiographs if height loss or back pain indicate them. The major risk factors are as we would expect from FRAX and additional information recommended includes bone turnover markers, full blood count and renal function and cognizance of secondary causes of osteoporosis as listed there. With primary fracture prevention, we've heard from Eugene of the exciting data from the UK, um, from the SCOOP trial, that 28% reduction in hip fracture risk over five years by FRAX-based risk assessment and uh, pharmacological intervention in women aged 70 to 85 years. We also have the meta-analyses of comparable trials uh, from the Netherlands, Denmark and the UK that were published last year confirming the significant hip fracture reduction that was observed in SCOOP, but also documenting the reduction in any osteoporotic fracture risk and major osteoporotic fracture risk. For secondary fracture prevention, we have discussed the Capture the Fracture initiative. Uh, that was incepted at IOF in 2010. There are now over 600 fracture liaison services documented and over half a million uh, individuals with primary fractures who have been risk assessed and intervened in as appropriate with secondary fractures. And as you can see here, it's truly a global initiative. Uh, for the Capture the Fracture partnership that Jean-Yves outlined in detail, the major objective will be to increase by 50% the number of patients reached by these new post-fracture care, fracture liaison service systems. Um, the effort was described in detail with its five pillars. And the idea is that a whole series of countries as listed in the left-hand bottom panel there in 2020 and 2021 will have a generic uh, policy tool coupled with country-specific policy and clinical initiatives which will then be brought with key opinion leaders from those countries to policymakers to try and implement change with both top-down and bottom-up approaches. And finally, to return to where we started, integrated care pathways for bone health across the life course. We heard from Mary that we need to focus on the strengthening of primary care, on the building on secondary care excellence and on influencing stakeholders. And of course, as you can see in the graphic in the top half of the slide, that will have different aspects at different points in the life course. So much of our Blue Skies research has actually been on the influencing of risk um, uh, for policymakers in the, in, in the unborn child during pregnancy in the mother and then during infancy, childhood and adolescence. All of those measures will have dividends, but they are of course delayed dividends until that generation or the offspring of that generation reach the later stages in life when fracture incidence rates rise. We need to be aware of, um, of preservation 
of bone, bone mass and reduction of fracture risk in the early postmenopausal years. And just last year, uh, there was uh, an SKO initiative bringing together uh, expertise in menopausal hormone therapy and the swing back from the negativity generated in 2002 by the Women's Health Initiative and the appropriateness of consideration, particularly in that 50 to 60 year old postmenopausal age bracket. And then, of course, we come to the later stages that have been the principal focus of today, where we have secondary care after a fracture and primary initiatives being considered now at a serious policy level. We'll hear more about these at the Virtual Congress, as you heard at the end of jean Yves' talk, also with an educational lecture and discussion session uh, at the WCO 2021 Virtual, and come and hear more about this whole area at our future Congresses in 2022 in Berlin and 2023. Um, other than that, it simply remains for me to thank all of our speakers. Um, they've provided excellent overviews of a really topical policy and practice-based question. Uh, I've had quite a few questions come in uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the course of this webinar, and I think we can then move forward with uh, discussing some of these. So I will ask Dominique to take back the screen so that we can um, all uh, begin uh, our our our, um, our Q and A session. Okay, so let me let me start off, and this first one, uh, Mary, is for you. Um, it's about what the key components of an integrated care pathway ought to be in 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 more tangible terms than the triangulation that you presented, and how you'd sort of. Uh, operationalize the acceptance of that ICP uh, among policymakers. Uh, clearly, a challenge. But what 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 are the sort of um, wins that we've uh, observed both in this disease area and in other areas in healthy aging uh, that you're aware of, and tips that we might give to our listeners um, abroad. Thank you very much. It's an excellent question, and and uh, really uh, could be uh, a. a, a an entire presentation unto itself, but very quickly, the quick oh, the quick um, points to look to are having a multidisciplinary approach, making sure that primary care and secondary care are working together to meet the needs of the population. From a population standpoint, helping people to understand the importance of good bone health and what they can do to promote their promote good bone health as they age, because it is a real approach that involves every stages of one's life. And in terms of individual integrated care pathways in each country, it's ensuring that the global approach of integrated care pathways can be easily adapted and flexible to meet the needs in specific countries and particular parts of the world. Thank you for that. And um, any 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 additional comment from colleagues, um, Eugene or Joy? I think I think the main thing that we can do as part of developing this is to look at the case studies of integrated care pathways in other areas of medicine and learn from the successes that they've attained. I mean, you know, I, I would say that. Um, at obesity, for example, is one which has not succeeded. If you look at the stakeholder web diagrams and network diagrams and the various initiatives that have been tried, um, that has really been very difficult to achieve. And actually legislation has done more, you know, sugar taxes and so forth have done more in that direction than uh, attempting behavior change with integrated care pathways. But if we were to look at, say, widespread use of lipid lowering, there, there's been much better acceptance of the notion that you intervene, uh, risk assess, uh, and then have almost lifelong therapy from midlife. And uh, quite how that was achieved and 
um, what lessons there are for us seem to me worthy of, uh, of attention. Then I've had a few which I'll try and bring together on the sort of balance between secondary and primary prevention. And I suppose this really would be for you, Jean-Yves. Um, so why do we not focus on the low hanging fruit that secondary prevention clearly gives us and have our a, a sort of exclusivity of focus on that rather than using our energy in in you know primary and childhood and all the other uh, components of uh, of the preventive pathway well that's clearly an important issue and we know as you mentioned that uh, focusing on secondary prevention will probably provide results that can be more tangible or at least quickly tangible compared to other strategies but i believe that that no strategy alone will be sufficient to to solve the global issue and what is really important is to have all stakeholders when i mean stakeholders i mean public health professionals payer policy makers involved during the will of the life course um, if we if we look to the other strategies uh, your team professor cooper in southampton has been pioneer in showing that uh, we can build, build both health from really early in the life course in, in pregnancy in new births in children in adolescence and that can be achieved through a better better dietary habits and a better lifestyle that includes physical exercise calcium vitamin d proteins intake and we know that by by increasing a little bit bone health at the end of the adolescence we can substantially reduce the risk of osteoporosis later in life and, and as uh, Professor McCluskey has shown primary prevention can also provide a lot of benefit by a relatively inexpensive approach, which is screening, uh, we can reduce hip fracture and that's cost saving. So I think that's that's a global approach that can take place through the life course. We should not neglect secondary prevention because ethically we need to treat those patients. We need to build structures that allow us to treat patients who are not treated today and who deserve a treatment, but clearly working throughout the life course in children and adolescents, in primary prevention, is something that will help us to solve the issue. Great, well, thank, thank you. And clearly the sort of uh, more plural uh, approach uh, 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 across the life course. I suppose the, the reflection is that the the PFC, um, you know, Capture the Fracture Partnership program is a really concerted attempt at delivering an ICP across um, all first fractures, uh, trying to prevent the second. And it, it will yield a lot of experience as to how we, we get on in influencing policymakers, particularly once the pandemic settles. Uh, it, it'll, it'll provide us with really important um, information about how successful we are in that direction. I think that I think if we are not successful in that direction, that will tell us a lot that we have to learn about influencing policy. But if we are, then it might give us pointers, of course, for the for, for the primary. And then to sort of go on to that, Eugene, the ones that I've had relating, I've had a couple here about um, <coughs> At what point, and they come from sort of different um, healthcare systems, I think, but at what point would one feel that the screening approach for high risk, i.e. the primary prevention, if we could call it that, at later ages, based on some kind of risk assessment method such as FRAX, um, at what point can that be considered validated from the point of view of introduction to policy? It's really touching on the, the sort of maturation of Wilson Jungner into the more modern approaches to when you approve a screening program. And what, what boxes do we have to complete before we're in that sort of position, do you think? Well, I, I think we're, we're pretty far down the pathway of giving serious consideration to screening programs. And uh, I guess uh, one of the uh, easy answers to part of your question is, where might we do this? And of course, uh, the incidence of fracture varies enormously across the globe. Uh, but there are many high risk countries with a, a very high burden of, of osteoporotic fractures. And it's really in those settings where screening is going to be most cost effective. Uh, if we can translate studies like SCOOP and ROSE and uh, SOS into routine uh, clinical practice. Uh, 
So I think the evidence base is really quite strong. The question is really all about the implementation. And I think there we have to go back to the individual countries because we have to obviously persuade the payers uh, to uh, invest in this approach. We need to work closely with primary care to see what systems uh, can be put in place that are actually functional. Um, I think that we can't sit in a sort of ivory tower and say, we've got the solution. Uh, we need to uh, take the top down, bottom up approach uh, to find uh, the, the happy medium where things actually are functional and more importantly, effective, uh, because uh, we want this to be a long term sustainable uh, initiative. Uh, it shouldn't, as Younger and Wilson said all those years ago, it shouldn't just be a one off uh, that we show success one time and then it all falls by the wayside again. We need to embed this into uh, the primary care setting in a way that translates into long-term efficacy and effectiveness. Wise words, thank you. And I, I, to be honest, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed the discussion. We could carry on for a week uh, on this theme, but sadly, uh, we've, we've, we've come to the end of the uh, allotted time for us. Um, it simply remains for me to thank all of our speakers. You've done a terrific job on behalf of IOF, SKO, and the Economist um, Unit, please um, uh, uh, have a big thank you to thank all of you for participating and joining us and wishing you well on behalf of uh, our um, stakeholder organizations and of course, Amgen, our sponsor. Thank you very much indeed and have a wonderful day.